Cuthbert. Good evening, everybody. Dr. Simon Cuthbert, a geologist with a wide range of interests, range, ranging from the origin of mountain ranges to exploration for industrial resources. He gained his BSc and PhD in geology from the University of Sheffield. So he obviously can't be all that bad if he's come down here. <laughs> Just up the road from you. Exactly. Where in addition to earthly preoccupations, I wonder what he's meaning by that. Um, he developed a fascination with planetary science that continues to inspire him. After three years in the oil industry and a postdoctoral fellowship at the Glasgow University, he moved to Paisley College of Technology, now the University of Western Scotland, where he was a lecturer for 30 years. But he is now a part-time researcher in geodynamics at the AGH University of Science and Technology in Krakow, Poland and a short course tutor at Glasgow University. He believes that the nexus of geology and astronomy is fertile ground, revealing the vast range of possible worlds and making us keep up a more open mind about how our own planet works. So there is Simon Cuthbert Field. So if you can all please put your hands up in a mixed and Swinton astronomical way to give Simon a good welcome. Over to you, Simon. Thank you very much. Thanks for that introduction. And uh, thanks everybody for um, inviting me to speak to you this evening. Um, most of the talks I've done recently um, have been to local societies in, in Scotland. So it's nice to spread my wings and perhaps return to some of my roots because I spent, so I lived for she in uh, Sheffield for seven years. Um, and in fact, I used to come across past your way to what was then RAF Finningley, oh. where I was a pilot off student pilot officer in the University Air Squadron, and I used to fly training aircraft. So in the in the late seventies, if you ever saw a bulldog hurtling out of the sky towards your car park, that was probably me struggling to keep airborne at the time. Um, and actually, um, to make a kind of Radio Two link. I was sitting in one of those aircraft in a hangar practicing all my maneuvers on the ground and a friend of mine was sat next to me who was a geology student as well and he said uh, why don't you try a final year project on the geology of the moon um, and I'd been a bit of a moon geek up until then um, I had my walls ice cream moon fleet captain badge and um and so I decided to do a project on the geology of the lunar highlands, and that's uh, kept me uh, occupied and interested as a sort of sideline ever since. And um, uh, so uh, my, my latest interest has been Mercury, which I'll be talking about this evening. And um, Mercury's a bit of an unsung planet, I think. Um, but we've had some fantastic information about it recently, uh, relatively recently. Um, from the messenger probe and there's going to be a lot of excitement as Bepi Colombo reaches Mercury in the not too distant future for giving us some really good uh, high resolution information. So I'll, um, I'll share my screen. Um, so uh, I've decided to call this the incredible shrinking planet uh, and there's a, a number of reasons why in a small and perhaps a large way Mercury has got or is getting smaller. Um, uh, so actually, um, I was just checking earlier on and trying to peek out of my window from my man cave here um, to see if I could see Mercury in the sky, because you can just about see it at the moment, uh, low in the sky in the southwest, at least from Glasgow, um, in the uh, just just as just as the sun's setting, um, a little pink dot in the sky. It's a bit hazardous to try and look for because uh, it's very close to the sun. So you need to be a bit careful with a telescope or binoculars. Um, but from now, I think until April, it's not too bad. Um, so here's a, here's a view from perhaps a more exotic place uh, in uh, Tuscany. I think I'll just put my laser pointer on. Here we go. So I've made a pink dot here, but there's a little pink dot here 
uh, in the sky, just as you can see, just above the sun, the sunrise at dawn. Um, and uh, so th this this is this little difficult to view planet um, that wanders around the sky um, uh, that we can often see around this time of year. So let's go back to kind of uh, a little bit of information about early views and um, associations of early civilizations with Mercury. And um, a lot, of course, a lot of the planets have been associated with deities um, in the, um, the great civilizations, especially of the, uh, the Middle East and the Far East. And the earliest records that we, we have uh, that mention Mercury were from the Assyrians in these wonderful uh, clay tablets, cuneiform tablets. And this one uh, goes back to nearly 700 BC. And, and from this, we can see that the Assyrians recognize Mercury as what they called the jumping planet because it sort of seems to jump around the sky on either side of the sun. Um, and uh, so if we follow that through from, from then, uh, the Babylonians had a god called Nabu. Um, and like a lot of subsequent deities uh, that I'll mention, it seems to be quite often Mercury associated with writing and knowledge and, and, uh, and, and therefore the, the messenger, of course, which we'll be familiar with. Um, Nabu became associated through the links between the Babylonians and the Egyptians with Toth here, uh, who's there uh, writing um, and putting his knowledge down on papyrus. Um, and then uh, through uh, the Greeks and the Romans and their associations with um, uh, with Egypt, uh, we got uh, Hermes and then, of course, the Romanized version Mercury. And that became associated with a day of the week, of course. So uh, the Roman day for Wednesday is called Mercury, Dies Mercury, uh, which became in France Mercredi. Um, and then the Romans used to like, when they met the barbarians from the Germanic tribes, they used to like to try and um, give the um, characteristics of their gods to the local deities. And one of the Roman uh, generals um, decided that he would link Wotan or Odin um, with um, Hermes uh, or Mercury. Um, and therefore Odin became related or, or, uh, or Wotan related to Wednesday, of course, which uh, Wednesday is Woden's day or Onstag as it is in Swedish and Norwegian. So a lot of these linkages actually come up to us today all related to Mercury. Uh, it has, a, it's had a small effect on, uh, on culture. And I found this lovely, uh, rather striking image from the Italian artist, uh, sort of cubist artist from around the early 20th century, Giacomo Balla. And actually this is, uh, uh, a rather impressionistic uh, abstract uh, impression uh, view of what it would be look like uh, what it would, would be to look like to look through a telescope um, at mercury passing across the front of the sun so the the dark spiral is to give the impression of the tube of the microscope and all of the light lines here are internal reflections of the sun inside the uh, inside the telescope um, and here we see the little black dot of Mercury passing across the front of the sun there. Um, so anyway, if we actually get down to, if I can get this to move. Hang on, I think my screen's frozen up just a moment. That's better, right, okay. Right, so if we uh, stay in Italy um, a little bit before that, and we go to some of the earliest telescopic observations uh, of Mercury, then as Schiaparelli in the late 1880s um, made a remarkable image here with a lot of observations and a very good eye um, of surface features on Mercury for probably the first time. And we see this network of dark features here uh, and we'll see how that came about in a, when we see some of the messenger images soon. But what he noticed was a, a network of um, lower albedo or, or darker features, less reflective features. Um, I suppose a bit like uh, 
uh, was was noted on Mars in observations uh, a little later. Um, and then, uh, so what he proposed, because he was able to follow some of these features during the rotation of the planet, was that uh, um, basically the, the length of the year or, or a single orbit was the same as the length of a spin of the planet or one day. Um, well, that didn't turn out to be quite right. And we now have a better idea about that, which I'll mention in a moment. But um, the other thing that he was able to notice is the rotation axis has a very small tilt, um, much, much smaller than the Earth. It's almost upright in relation to the plane of the ecliptic or the plane of its orbit, at least. Um, and uh, I'll come back to that as well. Our modern observations show that uh, Mercury has a spin to orbit coupling of pretty much exactly three to two rather than one to one. Um, and for some strange reason, which has uh, got to do with these orbit um, um, spin relationships, which I'm not going to attempt to explain now, um, but, but basically this, this does actually mean that the relationship between the day length of the, and the year is about a ratio of two to one. Um, so in other words, the day that there's two year, two days to a year. Um, the other thing about Mercury that we now know is that it has a very high ellipticity. It's not a circular orbit. Um, Earth's orbit is at the moment at least almost circular. Um, but Mercury actually has significant changes in distance from the Sun um, relative to the orbits of the terrestrial planets. Um, and a very strange outcome of this relationship between the orbit and the, the day length is that if you're looking at the sun over the course of a very, very long day, you may actually see the sun reverse direction in the sky and start going back the other way. Um, and of course, if that happened on Earth, you'd be very disturbed indeed and things would start sliding around. Um, but but uh, of course, Mercury does it at a rather more sedate rate. So um, the first close-up mission to Mercury uh, came in the early 1970s with Mariner 10, which was also uh, viewing Venus. Um, and here we have a, uh, an image of um, Mercury, uh, of Mariner 10. Um, and we can see the, uh, the, the, the normal features that you'll often see on these craft, these little craft with the big solar panels, um, the, the TV cameras here, um, and uh, it was remarkable with the kind of technology that they had then that they could get these TV cameras and get them to go to the moon and Mars and Venus and Mercury and work very well. Um, you'll notice that it needs a parasol or a sunshade because of the enormous energy that close to the sun, which would otherwise fry a lot of the instruments. Um, uh, and then we have uh, various observations that were made in the infrared and plasma observations uh, where there's a lot of hot, hot ionized material near the sun um, and uh, uh, the antennae for, uh, for transmitting and receiving information um, and uh, charged particle telescopes, very important for particularly looking at charged particles from the sun and moving through any magnetic field that it may have had. And the magnetometer here, uh, which is stuck out on a long pole so that it's not interfered with by um, magnetic fields from the electronics. Um, and uh, so here's a mosaic of images from um, uh, Mariner 10 of Mercury. And, and in a way, it looks quite familiar, doesn't it? It looks a bit like the moon. It's got this uh, heavily cratered surface. Um, and uh, like the moon, uh, it's got lots of very large impact basins on it. And not so clear from this image, but we'll see some more later on. Um, uh, the surface is very rich in dust, which was a bit of a preoccupation with the uh, NASA when they and, and the Russians when they first wanted to go to the moon. Um, and uh, but there are some differences too with the moon. It's darker, coloured uh, overall. Uh, it's actually a bit less crater than our moon, um, although we'll see that some of the craters, there were craters that used to be there, but they've been covered over now. Um, it does actually have an active magnetic field, um, uh, an active geodynamo like the Earth, but which the moon doesn't. Um, and uh, we can infer from bits of information that I'll mention quite soon that uh, 
um, one of the reasons for that is that uh, Mercury has a very large metallic core. Um, uh, Mercury only has a vanishingly thin um, uh, atmosphere or exosphere as it's called because it's so thin um, but it, it's, it does have a number of volatile elements in it including he, uh, hydrogen, helium, uh, free oxygen, ions um, and actually a number of other volatile metals like calcium and potassium and so on. Um, and remarkably uh, Mariner 10 was also able to at least give, give us a hint that in spite of its proximity to the sun there is ice in the polar regions uh, where Mercury uh, gets very little sunlight, rather like we've been discovering in the polar regions of the moon recently. So here's um, the next mission, which is where I'll get most of the images for the rest of the talk. Um, and his messenger was the Mercury Surface Space Environment Geochemistry and Ranging Mission, um, another one of these big mouthful acronyms that NASA seems to like to use and it was launched in 2004 and finally um, deliberately crashed into the surface of Mercury in um, 2015 just a few years ago. So here's the here's the craft uh, and uh, it has um, a dual imaging system on it, um, the MDIS down here, they all start with M for Mercury just in there behind the sunshade um, for imaging surface features and measuring the reflectivity or the albedo, uh, the amount of sunlight it reflects off. Uh, there's a gamma ray and neutron spectrometer which can measure the chemistry of rocks and soils and is also able to detect the presence of uh, water ice or other hydrogen rich materials. Um, there's an x-ray spectrometer, we quite often use x-rays uh, to actually do chemistry with rocks in the laboratory and they were able to use the same technology um, using x-rays coming off the sun uh, and uh, interacting with materials at the surface um, and they were able to also image the sun's x-ray flux that close it. Uh, um, there's a magnetometer there again out on a pole for the magnetic field strength. Um, the, there's a laser altimeter and this was able to map in great detail the surface topography because of laser pulse return times, but also uh, uh, detect little wobbles in the, in the entire planet, the libration. Um, and uh, by uh, measuring actually changes in the distance of the, um, the spacecraft to the surface because of extra little tugs of more massive parts of the planet's interior, um, through it through higher gravity it was actually one thing that was able to measure the gravity field rather like they did with the early missions to the moon. Um, then they were able to measure uh, atmospheric surface compositions through optical spectroscopy um, and they could measure the gases in the exosphere and also um, try to find what mineral materials or chemical compounds that made up the rocks and the soils of the surface. Um, they took a great interest and still do in the energetic particles in the exosphere or passing by uh, from the sun and moving through the magnetosphere uh, captured by it um, and then uh, exploiting the uh, radio transmission and receiving um, they were able not only to download the data but uh, it was able uh, NASA was able to very closely track its movements uh, tracking tiny little changes in direction and speed that help them understand the gravity field again. Okay well uh, uh, I guess um, uh, no science class is complete without a few data tables so I've got a, a couple here hopefully they're not too dry and dusty but, but let's let's have a look at some numbers about uh, the orbital characteristics of Mercury. Um, Mercury um, and the Earth on here, Mercury on the left and Earth on the right. Um, uh, the, the total uh, annual period um, for Mercury, because it's so much closer to the Sun uh, and has a smaller orbit, is 88 days against the Earth's 365, of course. Um, these figures here basically just give the shape of the orbit um, with the, the furthest and the closest approach in an, in an elliptical orbit. Um, and uh, so 
um, you can see here that actually compared with uh, the Earth here, which has an almost circular orbit, the eccentricity of the orbit of Mercury is quite a bit larger. And so it has fairly substantial um, differences in distance from the sun and therefore quite large changes in uh, um, surface heating by the sun's en uh, radiating energy. Um, the other thing about uh, Mercury is that its orbit uh, is tilted by about seven degrees to the general plane of the ecliptic or the plane of the other planets. So it's actually got a slightly tilted uh, orbit and that uh, has implications for when, it, when the best times are to, to view it from the Earth and different parts of the Earth. If we have a look at the planet itself and its, uh, its physical characteristics, um, I'm just going to move myself off the top here so I can see the top. On the left we've got Mercury and then the Earth in black and the Moon in red in the next column. Um, so we can see then that the rotation period uh, of Mercury is a lot longer uh, so over 1400 hours. Um, its axial inclination, it, it spins almost upright in comparison to the plane of its orbit, um, whereas the Earth of course is tilted over by 23 and a half degrees um, and that will affect the seasons. There won't be any seasons effectively on Mercury. Um, the radius at the equator and the pole, like the Earth, are slightly different to each other. It's, it's slightly flattened because it's a slightly viscous body that, that spins and tends to sort of spread out in the middle like a, like a bit of a beer belly. Um, and you can see that the uh, Mercury is uh, quite a lot smaller than the Earth, um, uh, but it's not too much different from the size of our own moon. It's a small planet. Um, the, the mass, um, these enormous numbers are a bit difficult to comprehend really. This is in uh, 10 to the 24 kilograms. Um, then, uh, so you can see that Mercury is substantially less massive uh, than the Earth, um, although more um, than the Moon. Um, that's because it's slightly larger than the Moon, but also um, because it's got a lot more heavy material inside it, as we'll see. And if we convert the volume and the mass to the density, um, then you can see that mercury is almost as dense, has an almost similar average density to the Earth. Um, the Earth um, is actually the densest planetary body in the solar system. But in fact, if you correct the density for the, for the compression, for the way in which the weight of the material presses down on stuff inside the deeper interior, um, it turns out that Mercury is actually substantially denser than the Earth. And that, that, that must mean that there's more heavy, dense material in the planet's interior uh, than, um, uh, for Mercury than the Earth. Um, and uh, let's put my pointer back on again. Um, and, uh, uh, and the reason for that, it's probably because there's a lot more metallic iron, which is very dense in the planet's interior. Um, so um, that will have an effect on the surface gravity, but nevertheless, the small size of the planet means that you'd actually feel pretty light if you were bouncing around on the surface of Mercury. Um, this number here, it seems a bit obscure. Um, it's actually a measure of the way in which mass is distributed inside the planet. Um, and and for, a, for a spherical planet with a uniform interior density or distribution of different materials, the number should be about 0 0.4. Um, and you can see that the moon quite closely approaches that um, because most of the material it's made of is rock and there's only a small core. Um, for the Earth, it's, it's a lot less than that. Um, Mercury is um, just, just a bit more nearly uniform inside. Um, but in fact, the reason for that is because its core, its iron core is so enormous that it actually takes up a very large part of the planet's diameter. So that's why it more nearly approaches the number 0 0.4 than the Earth does, which, which has a big core um, for a terrestrial planet, but not as big as Mercury, relatively speaking. Um, if you want to escape from the surface of Mercury, then um, you don't have to go as fast as you do to get off the surface of the Earth. And the reason I mention that is because um, it's easier to spoil material off the surface 
from things like meteorite impacts and put them into space or into the orbit around the outside of it, which I'll come back to towards the end of the talk. Um, this number here simply tells you uh, the magnetic dipole moment that um, Mercury does have a measurable magnetic field. Um, it's orders of magnitude less strong than the Earth's, but nevertheless, it's there. And that means that something inside the planet is generating an active live magnetic field, what's called a geodynamo. And the implication of that is that there must be molten iron on the outer part of the planet's core, uh, like the Earth. Because you need convecting molten iron um, in order to generate that magnetic field. Um, uh, the tilt of the magnetic field is less compared with the spin axis um, than the Earth's. Um, so the, basically the magnetic um, poles are more upright. Um, the Earth's move around a lot, but generally they're at a higher angle to the geographical pole. Um, of course, because Mercury is so near the sun, the solar insula insulation or the amount of energy coming from the sun reaching the surface, this is in watts per cubic meter. Um, so this is a whopping 9000 watts per cubic meter. Um, and uh, um, so you would imagine it could be a very, very hot place. And, and of course, there's an enormous difference in temperature between the light and the dark side because there's no atmosphere to spread the energy around or no oceans. So we can conclude from this, this uh, pile of numbers here that Mercury does have seasons because of the, the, uh, um, the eccentricity uh, of, of its orbit. It gets further and nearer, so it has colder and warmer times of the year, but those seasons aren't contributed to by the tilt of it like they are on the Earth. Um, the orbital plane is inclined to the Earth's and because of this relationship between its orbit, its spin and the distance um, from, the, from the sun, there are local places on the surface of Mercury which get extremely hot for quite extended periods of the time. And they've been given the rather confusing name of hot poles. But there are certain places on Mercury where you definitely wouldn't want to sunbathe for too long um, near the equator. Um, Mercury has a very large dense body within it um, <clears throat> and that's the iron core and sometimes it's called the iron planet. Um, impacts because of its low uh, escape velocity can release material from the surface quite easily uh, and it has an active geodynamo uh, which is almost parallel to the rotation pole. Um, the surface temperature then if you take this insulation varies from about 100 kelvins, uh, which is way, way below uh, zero Celsius, um, minus 173 Celsius, uh, up to 700 kelvins, or that translates to about 425, 426 degrees Celsius. So an enormous difference in temperature um, from the dark side to the light side, and also from the poles, especially the sheltered part of the polar regions and the equator. So if we take some of that information and we also make some assumptions about what the, comp what the composition of the planet is like inside, um, it's possible to deduce, uh, if we maybe take a bit of our knowledge about the Earth and the other planets, that Mercury, uh, the yellow part here is the iron core, so you can see how big it is. Um, and it's thought to be solid in its deepest interior. And then there's this thick layer of liquid iron um, slopping around the outside of it, which is probably what generates the magnetic field. Um, it's thought that there might be actually a layer of iron sulphide um, uh, just on the outside of the core. Uh, um, FES, that's, that's, it's a bit like kind of fool's gold or pyrite, uh, but I think it's probably something called troilite, which you also find in iron meteorites. And then around that we have the rocky part, the, the iron poor uh, rocky part of the planet, which like on the Earth and the other planets is called the mantle. And this is mainly made of um, silicate materials, silicon oxygen and mainly magnesium and, and various other metals. And then a very thin, a relatively thin crust around the outside, which we know to be relatively poor in iron, perhaps compared to the crusts of some of the other planets. <clears throat> 
Um, so let's let's start to take a bit of a tour around and see what we can see at the surface here, which is where we can get most of our information. And this is a, a, a color image, a mosaic that's taken from the messenger uh, cameras. Um, and it's been stretched a bit to provide a bit of uh, um, a bit of contrast and a bit of color variation. It's not quite as obvious as this when you see it for real, um, but we can see a few features on it. So um, you see this circle here of lighter material, which has a slightly reddish or buff color. And these are these are found all around the planet, say down here as well. And these are called red planes, high reflectance red planes. Um, this is the famous Caloris Basin, Caloris Plan Planitia. Um, and then we get these uh, darker colors, and that's not just because it's lit less well, these are actually darker colored um, surface materials. Um, and actually they have a slightly bluish tinge to them. Um, so these are, these are called the blue planes. Um, uh, and then we get these darker, even darker regions as halos around a lot of the larger impact basins here, these kind of annually or aureoles uh, around some of the big basins uh, of low reflectance material. And they're quite interesting. They're, they have something interesting to say, which I'll come back to about what's been excavated out of the interior and dumped around the side of these big impacts. Um, and then like the moon, you know, just a pair of binoculars, pair of binoculars looking at the moon, you'll see these streaks of light colored material coming out of obvious impact craters. And this shows that the impact craters are actually relatively young. Um, and you can see that the, the way that the ejector material has sprayed out across the surface of the planet. And we see lots of these uh, around the surface here. And over time, over millions of years, these ejector um, blankets or, or sheets or sprays um, gradually darkened by a process called um, weathering or planetary weathering, which is mainly to do with the interaction of solar energy. Um, with the surface material. So over time they'll disappear and merge into the rest of the planet's background. So this, this shows that they're quite young features, by which I mean a few hundred million years. Um, we also get uh, distinctive types of craters like on the moon, but sometimes the features show up better because of the colour differences. So we get uh, craters like this one with an outer uh, wall and then a ring of mountains in the middle. Um, uh, and then uh, we get smaller ones with a, either a single peak in the middle or a smaller ring there. And there are lots of different varieties of craters and crater features that we can have a look at. Um, so here's a, an image which the colours have really been stretched and, and um, modified a bit so that we can see some of these features better. And you can see this, this distinctive difference between the yellowy and buff colours and uh, or reddish yellow colors um, in the um, high reflectance planes and the darker material which is now showing up in blue and the whites of the um, ejector um, lines here. Um, so if we, uh, see if I can get this, here we go, uh, get this spinning around. We'll see, it. so there's the Caloris Basin, it's a huge a uh, smooth light colored area. We see these young craters, we see these dark halos and large areas of these dark plains here. Um, and you can see that some areas are more rugged than others with more cratering um, and some areas like up here and around the polar regions are smoother. That's just, oops, I'll just spin that around again. I can, oops doesn't want to play ball. Okay. Um, this is the surface topography uh, from the laser altimetry on Messenger. Um, and you can see the color scale over here. So the, the colder, or the bluer and purple colors um, tend to be lower elevations above some average, um, which is in white. And then we go up to the hot colors and the browns and the reds giving us the the higher elevations and you can see that there are large regions like here. Um, we might even think of these being a, a topographically a bit like the Earth's continents as being upraised and very rugged. Um, we can see these blue areas which are often circular uh, 
um, and often cluster together, which are impact craters, and they're much lower. Um, uh, and then we have this vast area about maybe 40% of the planet where we have these rather featureless green areas, which are plains that are much less cratered. And we know from the moon and other planets that uh, the amount of cratering is related to um, uh, the age of the surface. So the, the older it is, the more, the more craters that have formed. And there was an intense period of cratering early on in the history of the solar system, uh, after which it died off after about 3,800 billion years ago, during which much of that happened. So you can say that the more cratered surfaces here are much, much older, um, and the smoother plane surfaces are, are considerably younger. Um, if we take a view down onto the, um, the poles uh, here, this, so this is looking down onto the North Pole, uh, we can pick out some of these surface features by, uh, again, this is topographic, so the, the reds tend to be higher and the blues tend to be lower. Um, and there's lots of these big features. There's the Caloris Basin or the Caloris Plains. Um, and uh, um, here's a big one here. You'll, you'll notice, by the way, that a lot of these uh, uh, features are named after artistic folk like uh, um, uh, composers of music, Rachmaninoff, Copeland, etc. Verdi there, <coughs> uh, except Caloris, which of course just means hot. Um, so uh, we have these large circular features, which like on the moon are giant impact craters from very large impacts um, quite early on in the history of the planet. They're, they're a very distinctive feature of the surface of Mercury. If we, um, if we take uh, both polar and equatorial projections of the surface and we look at the gravity mapping, um, the top two images here are variations in the gravitational attraction of Mercury and they're full of information about what it's like in the relatively shallow interior of the, of the planet. So again, hot red areas or hotter colors represent stronger gravitational pulls um, and the, the more blue areas are weaker gravitational pulls. And so um, for, for the technical geeks amongst you, that means milligals, which is a measure of the gravitational anomaly above some kind of average value. Um, uh, you, we can convert this to the thickness of the crust by making some assumptions about what the crust is made of relative to the planet's denser interior. Um, and uh, then we begin to get uh, maps that uh, that actually do a bit look a bit Earth or Venus-like, although the reasons are quite different. Uh, we have areas of relatively thick crust here, uh, over 60 or even 70 kilometers, um, uh, which correspond to the high standing topographic areas of the surface, just like with the Earth's continents. And then we see areas um, with much less strong gravitational pull, um, and they correspond to areas which mu with much thinner crust. And the, some of the big cr uh, impact craters here have very, very thin crust, uh, or possibly the crust has been completely excavated away, um, and the interior of the planet is actually exposed here. The reason it looks fuzzy at the bottom uh, in the southern hemisphere, by the way, is because um, the, the rather odd orbits that they were able to make Messenger do meant it was a long way away from the planet when it went round the south side, uh, much closer when it went around the north side. So the resolution of the data is not as good here. Um, actually, you, you can't really get very much useful information down here. But in the northern hemisphere, we can get a lot more. So there are quite big thicknesses in the crust uh, thickness, and a lot of that um, uh, is um, actually not just necessarily primary, but because of the way that the crust has been redistributed by excavation from big colliding objects. Um, if we if we uh, have a look at gravity a bit more in the sense that we've done with the moon, um, so here's a rather striking image of Mercury with uh, the gravity intensity just transparently superimposed onto the surface, and we find that big impact basins like this one here um, correspond to much higher uh, gravitational attraction. I think I got that wrong in the last slide, but anyway. Um, and what's going on here is that all the light, low density crust, which doesn't give you much of a gravitational tug, has been excavated away 
um, and the dense interior is much closer to the surface. So uh, underneath any point on the planet here, you've got more dense material underneath you than you have here, where it's kind of diluted a bit by the light, low density crust. And so you get a higher pull of gravity over these thin uh, um, uh, crustal areas where huge impacts have excavated the crust and penetrated down into the denser rocks underneath. And these are the places where as the, as the orbiter flies over, it gives a bit of a wobble as it gets a stronger tug from the planet's uh, gravity field. And by the way, like on the moon, they're called mass cons or mass concentrations. <coughs> Excuse me. But now let, let's have a look at some of the topographic features on the surface of Mercury. So um, the, the impact base, basins are very spectacular and beautifully preserved in a lot of places. There's, there's been no um, surface volcanism to bury a lot of them, completely at least, um, in some places. And there's been no erosion like there has on the Earth or uh, in the early days of Mars. So they, they're really beautiful. And um, here's a really big impact basin, Rachmaninoff, which has got this interior ring. Um, and it's got this terraced outer wall here. Uh, and this fill with this strange kind of bread crust crackling in the middle of it, which I'll come back to. So this is hundreds of kilometers across. And it's a big, a big impact crater. And you'll see that it's got this slightly striated, feathery looking uh, impact ejector blanket around the outside where everything that was in here has been thrown out. And we get this vague ring of small craters at about this distance uh, out, which are secondary craters that are created by big lumps of material being thrown out of the, the center of the impact basin. And, and big uh, craters like this um, tend to have a ring of mountains. And these are substantial mountains. Uh, they're certainly bigger than anything in the British Isles. They're kind of alpine altitudes here. Um, if we have a look at Caloris, um, which is called Caloris planitia, which just means plains, but the circular form of it and the slightly elevated topography around the outside indicates that it's a big, very ancient uh, impact basin, rather, rather like the, the Maria on the moon. Um, and it's got a distinctly different colour, which suggests that the interior fill to this is a different rock or soil composition to the exterior. And it's got a few big craters um, that have hit it subsequently, and they've obviously excavated some different darker bluer material um, from uh, underneath the blanket of material that's filled up this impact basin. You'll also notice that the interior of the Caloris Basin isn't as heavily cratered as its surroundings. So it must be younger and something must have filled it and smoothed it over. And it, you can see around the edge here the way that uh, it's embayed and the, the, the light coloured material is sort of looks like it's flowed up and filled up against the edge of scallops uh, in the edge of the basin there. So th this indicates that you've had a big lot of fluid material filling up the impact basin after the hole was excavated. Then we get these weird things on the opposite side of the planet, the, uh, the, the, antipo the antipode of the Caloris Basin, um, which are called uh, hilly and lineated or chaotic terrains. Um, and these, are, uh, these were thought um, at one time to be the result of severe disturbance of the surface as a result of the shock wave generated by the Caloris impact on the opposite side of the planet. And certainly there's a lot of deep valleys or probably rifts generated by big geological faults here. Um, and it's, this, this terrain here has certainly been highly tectonically disturbed. Um, so there's another little rift valley running along this way, uh, this way down here. And it's been modified by some later cratering, just like in these places here. And I'm going to come back to these chaotic terrains later because the story is slightly more interesting and complicated than that. Um, if we uh, now take a little bit of a flyby um, across some of the, the features of the surface here, um, one thing that's useful to do here um, is to realize that things like this are actually bowl shaped hollows rather than pimples that are sticking up like buttons above the surface. So 
Um, it's a good idea at this stage before I started off to actually stare hard at it and make yourself think that the bottom goes down rather than pops up towards you. And suddenly you'll, you'll see it pop down and it, it's obviously a bowl shaped uh, crater. So uh, we can see here that there's a crater here with quite steep walls. Um, the force of gravity on Mercury is not as strong as it is on the Earth. So if the rocks are strong, they can support much steeper slopes than they can on the Earth's surface. And it's got this characteristic mountain pimple in the middle of it, which is a characteristic of medium to small size craters. And there's another big one here, which has got this funny little a uh, uh, shadow across the middle, which I'll, I'll mention again. So here we go. I hope this is working for you. Sometimes it's a bit jerky. Um, oops. Come on. All right, I'll just talk through it. I was going to stop it, but it's obviously going to be too complicated. Here we have some old craters, very degraded with younger ones uh, in, in their edges. Um, here's a big crater with a big scarp across the middle of it. Um, that's actually a big geological fault that's cut across the crater after it's formed. We're now getting into some bluer, darker terrain where the surface soils are different. And here's a crater that's disturbed the size of another one. Is a beautiful terrace walled crater with a, a peak in the middle made of a slightly bluer material. Um, and uh, again, we've very smooth, young craterless surfaces. Now we're getting into some older surfaces with much bigger crater densities and quite a big ejector blanket. And note all this light colored material that's kind of decorating the dark blues here. This seems to be very volatile rich material, which I'll talk about towards the end of the, the talk. So there's a bit of a tour over some of the surface features um, that are typical of Mercury. Um, and if we pick up on a few of those, this is Brahms crater. Sorry, I haven't put a scale on these, but this, this would be tens of kilometers across. And we have a single peak. Uh, we've got an impact ejector blanket. This was probably rubble, an actually molten shock melted rock um, and then large lumps which have caused this again ring of small secondary craters around the outside of the ejector blanket and a smoothish fill near the middle where the impact melt has just rained straight back down into the crater and, and um, filled it up. Um, and here's just a close-up of the, the peak in the middle and these, these mountains would be um, maybe up to a thousand meters high. So the, the size of a Scottish Highland peak perhaps. Um, in this image here you can just about see these very subtle impact crater rays and this would have been more pulverized material probably also carried along by gases uh, um, that are volatilized by, by the impact. Beautiful terracing where the walls of the crater have collapsed along little faults, circular faults, into the hole left by the impact and a nice peak in the middle. Um, and if we if we uh, take a nice flyover image um, of a crater a bit like that, uh, you can see here the way that you get these very flat smooth surfaces in the valleys between the mountains. And this is because a liquid material has flowed in and filled up the hollows here and around the edge and you can see this these cracks or little rifts in the surface here so this these are either lavas where the volcanic activity has come up from the interior and filled it or it's uh, impact ejector melt and when it solidifies it shrinks um, as it cools down um, and because the surface is shrinking relative to the interior you get these cracks forming in the surface um, rather like mud drying and, and, um, and shrinking, forming mud uh, shrinkage cracks. But these would be substantial valleys that you, you'd be impressed by if you walked along. Um, if we zoom in to the edge of a crater like that, we see terraces which have these flat fills in them. And these are actually ponds of impact melt where it would have rained down from above after the impact and then collected and puddled in these uh, little fault terraces that have formed. Um, so these terraces must form very quickly 
um, even as the <coughs> impact ejector is falling back out of the skies um, onto the surface. And we've got more impact ejector fill here, which was all liquid and flowed out. And you can see it filled hollows in the, in the uh, topography at the crater bottom there. So monster amounts of molten rock material and rubble, a kind of mush of partly melted rock. Um, this is uh, Ratted Ladi, uh, which has got, uh, again, a ring. Um, it's got a, in this case, um, probably melt in the middle here. It could be volcanic lava though. Again, with these circular shaped shrinkage rifts here. Um, and what'll often happen is that the melt will solidify first around the edges against the cool surface underneath um, while underneath the skin of it it's still molten here so as the center shrinks it breaks away uh, from the outside here um, and forms these circular shrinkage cracks and that's later been impacted by a subsequent uh, um, impact uh, here and a lot of the, rub uh, the rough appearance here is rubble uh, an impact rubble that's fallen into the outer ring. And then an, again, a nice terraced uh, outer wall uh, with a lot of collapsed wall material filled in by little ponds of impact melt. Um, and then uh, a close up of one of these younger craters, excuse me. Um, and uh, we can see this very bright. Um, uh, ejector and the rays spreading out over the surface. Um, we do get uh, hints of um, different materials that have been excavated by the craters. So geologists can actually use uh, these craters here as a bit of sort of nature's drill holes to, to work out what might be being excavated from deeper underneath. And very often, as I've shown you before, we get these dark halos. Here, here's one in monochrome. Here and here are some in uh, where the colour has been enhanced and altered so that you can see them better. And so there's obviously some kind of different darker rock material below a relatively thin surface layer of this yellow stuff here. And it'd be interesting to work out what that is. Um, the lighter coloured stuff here is different again. Um, and we'll come back to this crater and have another look at it. But this, this is an indication that a lot of the material under the surface is actually quite volatile and actually boils off at times. Um, so there, there, there's a lot of volcanic activity uh, evidenced in, on Mercury. And here's a, uh, a crater that's been almost filled up to the rim. So this is more likely to be lava from the planet's interior. Um, and it's in, in places like here, it's almost brimmed over the surface of it there. So we get these relatively smooth uh, interiors to the craters. And in places like this at uh, Angkor Vallis, which is a valley that runs between two craters, this one here and this one here, uh, we have lava that's actually flowed through here, through this valley, and it's carved out this valley. Um, and it's then filled in this other crater over here and ponded over here. Um, and if you look at this area here, um, and we take a close up oblique view of it, um, we see it here. So there's a crater, and these are actually levees of solidified lava um, that have been piled up in the lee of this crater as this monster lava flow has gone past here. So that's actually a five kilometer wide crater. So you can see the size of these lava flows was very substantial. This, this feature actually looks a bit like some of the um, uh, catastrophic river valleys in uh, on Mars, but because there's no water here. Um, and this is probably molten lava forming this rather than um, rather than water. Um, this beautiful colour image here uh, is a topographic image from the altimeter of the polar regions. And across here, we've got these this sort of smooth bald surface here where the whole surface has been paved over with lava rather like basalt that's probably erupting from Iceland or Hawaii on earth at the moment and you see these ghost features in it so there's a crater that's been almost completely buried there's another one there and there are just little hints of them here <clears throat> so this this mercury a bit like Venus actually has been 
<coughs> excuse me, has been substantially resurfaced over large parts of its surface um, at some stage in its history. And actually some of the craters outside there have seemed to have been filled by lava sourcing itself from directly below these craters. This one here is an example of a crater that's been flooded from the lava plains out here and it's filled in this one once the, once the level was able to breach the, the ridge over here. Um, and if we take a, a different look with a low um, illumination level here, uh, this looks very much like the lunar Maria surfaces in a way. When you, when you illuminate them at a low level, you see these what are called wrinkle ridges here, which are, which are a bit like a kind of rucked up tablecloth or, uh, uh, you know, the surface of the skin on a bowl of custard if you disturb it a bit. Um, and these are literally where the surface of the lava has hardened or solidified a bit, but the interior is still molten. Um, and if there's any kind of slope on the surface, then you get a bit of rucking up um, and forming these ridges, which are, again, they're, they're actually substantial ranges of hills and mountains, these things. Um, some of the buried craters uh, have shrinkage cracks in, so they're called, they've got the charming name of pie crust craters, because uh, they look just like a shrunken crust of, of um, pastry over the top of, a, you know, a steak pie or something like that. Um, and these are small subcraters inside the big uh, Goethe basin. Um, and here are lots of examples of wrinkle ridges from uh, uh, directly above. There's some here, running down here, all over the place. And in fact, if you get a decent telescope or a good pair of binoculars on the lunar maria at low illumination, you'll see the same sort of thing. And here's a little pie crust crater uh, in the middle of it. So most of the area of this image has actually been covered over by enormous, hugely extensive flows of lava. Uh, we see nothing like this on the Earth now, but in the Earth's distant past, actually similar things have happened. And Venus is, has a lot of areas that look like this. Um, lots of fantastic volcanic features as well. Um, here is this set of radiating fractures. It looks a bit like a bullet's hit a window, doesn't it? And you get these radiating cracks and the, the mechanism is not dissimilar. Um, probably underneath here there's been a very buoyant mass of um, magma which has been pushing up locally, a um, bit like you know a, a beach ball um, in a bath uh, trying to float towards the surface where there's a, there's a skin over the surface um, or maybe a layer of ice over the surface. Um, and uh, it's shattered and pushed up the surface and, and broken it up into these cracks here above the main point of impact here, main point of push from below. And just to confuse things, there's actually a crater landed in the middle of it. So that crater's got nothing to do with the cracks. It's a later feature. So this is telling us that there are big balloon-like masses of lava um, coming up below the surface. And again, we see similar features on the Earth. Um, Here's a small feature near um, Rachmaninoff uh, with a, with a, this isn't to do with illumination, these are very reflective deposits that are coming out of this pit here. And if we zoom in on it here, we see a feature here which looks very, very similar to craters of very explosive volcanoes on the earth. Um, so a few kilometers across and some of it's been obscured by some kind of landslide in the middle of it here. Um, but around the edge here it's beautifully clear and you can even see strata exposed in the sides of the crater here where it's been excavated of uh, lighter and darker coloured materials, probably lavas and, and um, uh, old soils on the surface underneath it. So this is a sign of a very explosive eruption um, and that's what's probably put all this light coloured stuff around the outside. So explosive eruptions mean that you've got a lot of very volatile um, uh, substances inside. On, on Earth, it would be carbon dioxide and water. On Mercury, it may well be carbon dioxide, um, but there are other possibilities as well, like sulfur compounds, for example, or, or even chlorine. And if they get heated up enough, they boil, uh, the pressure builds up underneath and you get an explosive eruption. Um, so here's an example of something like that on a totally different planetary body, which is Io, one of the moons of Jupiter. 
And you can see that here we have one of these amazing eruptions that were captured by one of the Voyager missions, I think, uh, of a volcanic plume on Io. Io is the most volcanic object in the solar system. Um, what happens is you get a vertical jet of material because there's no atmosphere to stop it. And then it, it, it uh, ballistically, the particles spread out and come down to rest on either side. The bigger particles falling near the middle and the smaller ones spreading out a bit further. And, and the jet is probably emerging from a similar kind of pit in the surface to that that we see on Mercury. Um, we see other evidence of volatiles being blown off or boiled off from the interior in these strange clusters of hollows uh, that are an almost unique feature of Mercury. Although they look a bit like what's called the Swiss cheese terrain in the icy polar regions of Mars, in fact, where you see similar things where uh, gases boiling off from the inside leave a void um, in the materials underneath where the, the gas is, uh, has um, evacuated, the roof collapses and you get a hollow in the ground here. And you get very extensive areas of these. This, this is actually the floor of a, of a crater. It's the area I showed you before in a blue image. So we get this strange kind of crinkly, uh, corroded looking terrain where something has boiled off from underneath the surface uh, and the surface has collapsed to replace it. Um, uh, I suppose a bit like a, a limestone um, cave would collapse if the water is eroded away too much of the roof above it. Um, so these are bright hollows and they're quite young and quite small. Um, and we actually tend to find them in regions where we've got lots of dark materials. So these volatiles are associated with other dark materials which have also come from the interior. Um, and uh, so we think that these might be due to rather violent uh, uh, eruptions or boilings off of volatiles. And you need a source of heat to do that, which is possibly hot magma coming up from underneath and warming the soil up and causing it to boil off. Um, here's one of these scarps I showed you in the flyby earlier on. Um, so this is actually a range of mountains with a steep side on the right in shadow and then a slow tailing off on the left here. Um, in your part of the world, you might think of this as maybe a bit like the edge of the Pennines over to the west of Sheffield there. Um, and there's another one coming across here and it actually cuts across that one there. Um, so uh, here's an a, a ele elevation model of it from the altimeter data and you can see this scarp like range of mountains and it chops across a crater so it must be younger uh, than this this big crater and also younger than this little one in the middle of it so we can start putting together um, a kind of narrative or a story of different events that happened here and uh, some more images here so this is quite a large part of the surface of mercury and there's one of these um, what's what are called rupees or dorsa uh, a scarp or a ridge and actually this if if you look at it here this is very much like the himalayas the tibetan plateau and the indian four deep the ganges plain here uh, on the earth here and the scale is not actually all that different really um, or it could be a bit like the alps and the po plain in italy um, and an explanation of this is a bit similar to to the himalayas and the alps and that is that there's a very large fracture or fault that goes deep below the surface um, and the stuff on the left here is being pushed up along this crack um, and riding up over the material on this side here and you get an elevation change because the surface is pushed up here. Now you can see the way that the rocks are moving relative to each other on this fault, it's called a thrust fault, um, and that, that can only be done if the actual crust is shrinking. It's being pushed from either side um, and the crust is in compression here. Um, it's causing this crack to form and one side is riding over the other. Um, and these, these are quite common on Mercury. And in fact, there, there are a lot more of these contractional crack or fault features than there are ones that are caused by stretching or extension forming rift valleys. Um, and uh, by adding up all of the possible shortening 
or compression across these faults it's been estimated and here's the shrinking planet bit one of them that actually mercury has contracted overall by between two and seven kilometers um, during the time that these faults were operating and that's probably because the planet of course is cooling and losing its interior heat so it's thermally contracting and shrinking um, uh, there have been other uh, possible explanations like there was an early tidal bulge as the planet spun and it was a bit softer and so spread out a bit more as it spun um, and then as it hardened up and cooled over time that relaxed or maybe as it spun a bit slower that relaxed um, and that caused contraction around the waistline of the planet but actually you find these over the polar regions as well so that doesn't quite add up. Um, of course, th this idea of a cooling planet with the cooling causing shrinkage in mountain ranges is uh, uh, rather like a shrinking apple that's uh, where the skin's kind of drying out um, or the interior is drying out relative to the hard skin uh, was applied to the earth uh, in the 19th century by a lot of very influential geologists. And uh, they explain things like the Himalayas and the other Altin Targ and the um, other big mountain ranges of the earth, uh, um, the, the Alps, for example, over here in the Caucasus and the Balkans. Um, uh, uh, all of these as a result of a shrinking earth. But of course, now we know, as you can see from these lines here, that on the earth, these are caused by plate tectonics, by the convection of the earth's interior, um, which is also ultimately caused by the way that the earth gets rid of its heat, but in fact is not the same as the, the fact that the earth is actually shrinking. Um, there's another cause. The Earth probably is shrinking, but plate tectonics is so dominant over the way the planet looks that you wouldn't know whether there was an effect from shrinkage. Um, but with Mercury, we have a good idea that that's actually the cause. Um, okay, I need to move on because I'm taking up a lot of time here, but, but um, uh, some, uh, we can just quickly uh, do uh, geological mapping using uh, orbiting uh, photographic images here and we can we can work out for example that this little area of crater impact ejector uh, is is overlapping that one so this is younger than that and then this little plains area here is embaying the edge of that so these are probably lavas which filled in this area here and we can begin to put together an order of things happening um, and work out which surface features and which rock strata are formed in what order and if we do that we can start to put together um, uh, a kind of time order of the history of mercury and give names to the time periods like geologists love to do um, and so we have these uh, rather wonderful names here um, on uh, on mercury so the oldest th this is the start of the solar system at four and a half billion years and this is now we have the Tolstoyan, um, the pre-Tolstoyan, the Calorian, the Mansurian and the Kuiperian here, which, uh, which are where distinctive uh, geological units have formed. And this is the very oldest material, actually most of which we never see because it's buried under this stuff, but we just assume, assume that there's something older. If you compare it with that on Earth, we've got the stuff that we never see down here, the Hadean, the oldest rocks like the ones we find in the north of Scotland, the Archean, the Boring Billion, the Proterozoic, and then the bit where most obvious visible complex life on Earth formed, the Phanerozoic. And on most of the other planets, while all this was going on and still is, pretty much nothing's happened and they've all sort of thermally died. Um, if we have a look at the, the composition, from the uh, geochemical measurements here uh, we can make maps of the surface composition and it's easier often to do this with ratios of chemical elements than it is with um, uh, than actual compositions measured quantitatively because that's quite difficult to do from space so this is the ratio of magnesium to silicon which is an important ratio for planets or through the universe we now know um, and so this regions like this um, have relatively high magnesium compared to silicon and the caloris area here rather lower um, and probably more silica rich relative to magnesium. 
And this is aluminium relative to silicon. Uh, again, two of the more common elements that we find in rocks. Um, and this is quite aluminium rich. Um, and uh, this is quite poor in aluminium over here where it's richer in magnesium. Um, and these are relatively non-volatile elements. And if we look at more volatile elements like the alkali potassium, uh, again, we see that uh, the caloris area here is quite enriched in volatiles uh, where the planet's been excavated by a big impact. But around the equatorial region here, um, it tends to be lower in potassium. And all of these have got to do with the rocks and all the rocks tell you something about what uh, has been going on in the planet's interior and has emerged to form a crust at the surface. So generally what we can tell is that Mercury overall has relatively magnesium rich rocks compared to some of the other planets uh, and they tend to be rather poor in silicon and iron and these resemble types of rocks found on the earth particularly the most ancient lavas that we know um, over three billion years ago called Kamatiites. Um, and uh, they're very, very hot fluid lavas that form by melting of the interior at very, very high temperatures. Um, there are regional variations in magnesium and aluminium, a bit like there are on Earth. So an area like this would kind of resemble rocks that are more like, say, some continental areas on the Earth. And these might be more like some of the oceanic areas, but you can't take that analogy too far. But if you play around with some clever chemistry and you make assumptions about what the raw material is that form mercury, then uh, we can say that most of these rocks, uh, these igneous rocks or lavas, uh, can be formed if the interior silicate mantle of mercury has the composition of a type of meteorite, or the kind of raw material of the solar system, a type called an enstatite chondrite. We normally assume that planets like the Earth, Venus and Mars form from what are called carbonaceous chondrites, which are more primitive. Um, but uh, Mercury seems to have had a, a slightly different kind of raw material that it formed from it in this region of the solar system close to the sun. Um, we, know, we also, intriguingly, going back to these dark materials and volatiles, can say something about their composition. And a flyby that was done where Messenger came quite low down and approached less than 100 kilometers from the surface got a bit of an anomaly in its neutron signal. Um, and that almost certainly indicates that these dark areas are very rich in carbon and they probably have a lot of graphite in. And that seems to be what's being excavated in a lot of these craters from a kind of layer not far below the surface, below a lot of the late repaving lavas. So in fact, it seems that at one stage, actually Mercury had a graphite crust. It had a thin layer, several kilometers thick, all the way around it, of the same stuff in your lead pencil. Um, now, uh, carbon is associated with quite volatile materials, of course, um, uh, and gases like methane and carbon dioxide. And this is that chaotic terrain again. You can see this kind of strange lumpy ground around here between boxes B and C here. And this is quite a recent study from an um, Earth Science Planetary Science Journal uh, where they mapped out this area of chaotic terrain here relative to the smoother terrain around the outside. And if you look at some of the, surf, the edges of the craters here, they look like kind of corroded, almost like they've been etched out. Um, but, but each one of these little pimples here is quite a substantial mountain, so this is a big scale. And we also see lots of linear rift-like or crack-like features in here. So there's been a lot of cracking and fracturing in this area. If we zoom in a bit, here are those two craters, and you can see this strange kind of corroded appearance that they have compared to, say, the fresher crater on the outside here. Um, so there's been a lot of loss of material here by some erosion or corrosive process. And we also have these linear features marked by the yellow arrows here, which implies that the ground is highly cracked or fractured. And that means that volatiles have got escape routes along cracks to the surface. So the explanation of these sorts of features um, is that uh, 
you start in like in this block diagram down here with terrain that's been heavily fractured, possibly by the shock waves from the Caloris Basin formation and more local cratering. Um, and these cracks or faults have been pathways to allow volatile um, gases or fluids to escape up and erupt at the surface, like fumaroles, maybe in, a, in an earth volcano. Um, some of them get trapped be below surface layers of lava and they, they might break out later on. Um, and uh, if you actually extend and you take that area that was mapped and you attempt to work out how much rock or, or material, crust material has been lost from this area by that etching or corroding process of volatile loss. You know, if you lose all this stuff from underneath, it'll leave voids, which then the rocks above will collapse into. You can actually work out um, that uh, over 2000 meters of crust material have sort of been lost from some parts like around here, simply by volatiles escaping through cracks into outer space above the planet. So Mercury is actually losing some of its crust into outer space by just escaping along fractures. And this will work if there's been some heat source underneath that gets the volatiles moving, boiling off. Another volatile, of course, is water. And here is a, an image of uh, the solar um, insulation intensity of the southern polar region. And in this area, the dark areas will be permanently much colder than the surroundings. And, and if you look at these uh, and you look at them with um, a, sometimes these earth based radar observations, you find uh, these are radar bright areas in the coldest parts of these craters on the poles. And this is actually water ice, large amounts of water ice on the surface, in spite of the fact that this planet is so near the sun and so hot in other parts. So again, more volatiles. Um, and then there's the exosphere, um, and this is a, an image of the concentration of calcium. Uh, so calcium is actually uh, uh, um, gets so hot in some of the crust here uh, that it forms a vapor like a plasma, um, and it's being streamed out in the planet's um, magnetic field lines uh, as they're swept out by the solar wind from the um, uh, from the sun here. So this this kind of uh, curved form it's pushing out towards the lee side of Mercury is because of the effect of the solar wind. Um, so where's this calcium coming from? Well what's probably happening is that Mercury actually occasionally as it goes around its orbit passes through a band of uh, meteorite or comet-like material from the tail of a comet that, that orbits around this way much on a much larger orbit than Mercury. Um, and every time Mercury goes through this cloud of debris, lots of it strike the surface and spall stuff off. And because of its low escape velocity, that stuff then escapes into the exosphere. Um, and uh, uh, if you can actually catch the dawn of the planet in your image, um, the dawn side of the planet, you get this beautiful image of those volatiles, which are basically being spalled off from calcium rich materials volatile rich materials in the surface. And this is probably calcium sulfide, which is forming part of the soil. And that may be also some of the stuff that's boiling off in these, these uh, Swiss cheese-like terrains too. Um, I was gonna give you a chemistry lesson, but I think I'll skip it because uh, by now you'll, if I, if I go through this, you'll be losing the will to live even more. Um, so what I'll finish with is just to look at uh, a sort of model for the origins of Mercury and how it's forcing us to reimagine the way we think about our own planet. So here's one model of the way in which Mercury might have formed. And this is the early sun. Um, this is the solar nebula. And within this, our planets are forming. So where it's cold out here, beyond the snow line, then we get Jupiter and Saturn and the ice giants and the gas giants. Um, inside there where it's hotter and those uh, materials stay volatile, um, then out here we get oxi oxide materials and silicates uh, and lots of oxygen combined with metals and silica silicon in here. Um, and then where it's really hot, um, heavier, denser elements that form metals tend to be, 
And because there's less oxygen for them to combine with, we tend to get uh, reduced or uh, oxygen poor metallic compounds here. So this is your raw material to build Mercury. This is your raw material to build the Earth, Mars and Venus. And this is your raw material to build your outer planets. And the solar wind is acting to redistribute this um, especially early in the history of the solar system. Um, so this might be Mercury formed here and stayed here and has been here all the time. And it's just this local environment near the sun lacking oxygen, uh, um, uh, which was its comfort zone. And that's what the raw materials were for it to form from. Um, and I, in a way, this looks a bit like a blast furnace. If you, you know, living where you are near Sheffield, where there's a lot of um, blast furnaces and uh, smelting and forging of metals, you might actually like to think about the solar system in very much the same terms as a blast furnace uh, with the hot bit here and the cooler bit out here. But another possibility to form Mercury, a bit like has been proposed for the Earth, is that it actually formed a protoplanet that was a lot bigger than the one that we see now and it differentiated into an iron core and a silicate mantle and crust. But then it was clobbered by a big impactor. And that essentially stripped away a lot of the outer part of Mercury, but left the big iron core in it. And so you have a smaller Mercury with a big iron core and not much of its silicate mantle left. And that's another way you can make a shrinking planet by basically knocking the outside off it. Uh, and these two models are being kicked around at the moment, and probably both of them have something to say. Um, another possibility with all the volatiles, which we wouldn't expect to get down here so close to the sun, you know, they belong out here, is that Mercury's actually wandered around a bit and maybe formed out here and has moved down into this reducing area here subsequently. And that's quite a, a kind of topical way of thinking about things in planetary science at the moment. Um, so finally, uh, then, if we take an evolutionary model, this looks a bit like the model for Mars and the Earth and the other in, inner planets. We start with a ball of molten rock and iron. The iron separates out as droplets and we get what's called the iron rain. And that accumulates in the middle of the planet along with some sulphide um, from this chondrite material, asteroid-like material that's the raw material for the, for the planets. Um, after that, um, then uh, we get uh, the core has formed, um, but, but actually sulphur behaves very strangely in Mercury, unlike on Earth because of the lack of oxygen. And it doesn't necessarily tend to like to be in the core like it does in most planetary cores, and it actually comes out and resides in the rocks in the mantle. Um, and likewise, silicon, um, like in some blast furnaces, doesn't like so much to be in the mantle but a lot of it is partitioned into the iron core so we get a low silica outer planet compared with the others um, and also carbon um, which often likes to be with iron like again in a blast furnace um, actually can prefer to be in the crust and what eventually will happen is that will float up to the surface as the molten uh, magma ocean here cools and forms this graphite crust over the top. And then the interior of the planet will gradually crystallize and fill up with crystals. And then later on, as it starts to convect and, and shed its heat through stirring its interior, then we get localized um, volcanic episodes and repaving. And a lot of the sulfur will boil off at that time and form some of these big explosive reactions and uh, eruptions bringing maybe things like chlorine and sul uh, calcium and things with it. And that, that explains quite a lot of the features that we see. The other thing is that a lot of the sulfur will tend to reside at the interface of the mantle and the magma ocean, which is why uh, we think that there's this iron sulfide skin around the top of the planet's enormous molten core. Well, um, we have this to look forward to to tell us a lot more about Mercury now, Bepi Colombo, which is actually two spacecraft in one. Um, and uh, uh, um, so uh, we just have a few years to wait now uh, as it does its multiple spins around the solar system before it finally gets there and divides off um, uh, with the Japanese and the European parts 
um, splitting off from each other to give us uh, a whole load of new high resolution information, especially about the southern hemisphere um, in the future. So we have that to look forward to. And in fact, um, a planetary scientist at the Open University that you may know, Dave Rothery, is one of the um, lead mission scientists on that. So we hope to hear a lot from the Open University as the materials come out. In the meantime, I've rabbited on for much too long, so I'll, uh, I'll finish there. And thanks very much for watching. Uh, thank you very much for that, Simon. Uh, we're going to ask questions now. Uh, usual uh, routine, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to put up a digital hand, that would be really useful. Uh, otherwise, wave at me if you've uh, got a question to ask. I've got a question whilst everybody's thinking. Um, you've mentioned uh, about uh, the volcanism uh, on Mercury, but is there any uh, evidence of uh, volcanoes as we'd recognise them, shield or cone volcanoes? Or is it all upwellings from uh, uh, from impacts? You don't seem to get the the kind of menagerie of different volcanic forms that you see on particularly Venus uh, or Mars. Um, most of it does seem to be um, flood volcanism, um, and uh, you get the occasional feature like that um, kind of radiating fracture fossae um it, feature that i showed you there um but but um most of them seem to be um flood eruptions um there may be a reason for that uh, in terms of what the lavas are made of because um uh, a lot of them are, are very low in silicon which makes them very runny and therefore they flow very easily across the surface um, and it does seem, in spite of everything I've said about volatiles, that a lot of them were actually relatively low in volatiles, at least early on. Um, and, uh, and so they tend to sort of flow out and spread out across the surface. They don't tend to clump like more viscous lavas do close to the place where they erupt from. So one of the reasons you get um, fewer, a smaller diversity of volcanic forms is possibly because there's a smaller diversity of lava types. Um, and the lava type that you get tends to form rather boring flat surfaces rather than spectacular volcano, you know, um, conical volcanoes like, like the classic ones that we're used to. Thank you for that. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, over to you. Question, uh, Michael Poxon. Yeah, uh, uh, to kick off, just to say, I used to know D Dave Rothery from, from the times when he uh, was a variable star observer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I just just put three three things together. Um, uh, the first one, uh, the fact that Mercury isn't as heavily cratered possibly as it should be. Uh, the, the second one is the high orbital inclination, which is prob prob probably unique among planets, isn't it? Um, and the third one is the eccentricity of the orbit. Do, do, do these three things put together? possibly suggest that Mercury has, in the deeper distant past, obviously, uh, migrated inward? I mean, even, even from somewhere like the Kuiper Belt? Um, I don't know that we have the kind of information uh, on that, like, like we maybe have for Mars, you know, which is so close to Jupiter and therefore is much more prone to that kind of thing. Um, I haven't seen much information about that. I think there are some hints about it. Um, the, the orbital inclination um, might suggest that it suffered quite a big wallop early on in its history, which put it into a different kind of orbit, I suppose. Um, how that relates to the, the lack of cratering on the surface, um, the evidence seems to be that that's because there was cratering, but it's been covered over. And wow. the, 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 a lot of the surfaces of Mercury, perhaps not to the extent of Venus, but, but a, a young, and therefore it probably was more cratered early on. And you see all these ghost craters that, that are sort of barely show above the surface there. So there's obviously a lot of buried craters. Um, although, um, in fact, you might expect Mercury to be more cratered than some of the other planets because um, it's nearer the sun. It's got the gravitational effect of the sun pulling all that debris towards it. Um, so, but... Uh, 
um, I, I think probably the jury's out on uh, whether mercury has migrated around a lot. Of course, the, the other thing that kind of indicates that is why does it have all these volatiles? Um, and there are two conflicting explanations about that. One, uh, which I think I actually heard Brian Cox uh, offering recently in one of his programs was that actually it formed out in a more volatile part of the solar system and migrated inwards and carried its volatiles with it. But actually you can explain all those volatiles by the different chemistry. Um, and it's not necessarily that the volatiles are the same as hydrogen rich and carbon rich, for example, and nitrogen rich as they are further out in the solar system. The volatiles are different. They're, they're, they're metals, um, they're things like chlorine and sulfur, um, but they behave in a more volatile manner because they don't have oxygen to keep them knocked into shape. Um, uh, and, uh, and therefore they, they kind of uh, enjoy that freedom from the tyranny of oxygen and they like to become gases and sort of blow out there. So um, I, I hope that Bepi Colombo will give us a lot more information on this and some firmer answers, but until that happens, I think we're in the hands of the computer modelers to, to <laughs> make wild speculations about what, where Mercury used to be compared to where it is now. But, uh, there are some hints, certainly. Thank you, Michael. Uh, any other questions? I'm looking around, I can't see anybody. Uh, John Leach, can you unmute yourself, please, John? All right, Simon, that was a, a fascinating talk. I loved it. Uh, I'm an ex chemist. And then when you got to the point when you said, I'm not going to go any further with the chemistry, I, I, oh, it, it was a, the sheer lack of oxygen, but the amount of chemical reaction that was going on mm -hmm. really. Wow, I, I thought this is this is this is mega. Um, I, I just found it so interesting. It, do we have a lot of catalytic effects with not having an uh, oxygen in the atmosphere? Um, I haven't seen anything about that at all. I, I mean, I think a lot of the processes that we're talking about here are very large scale, at very extreme conditions over very long time scales. Um, and forgive my shocking lack of chemistry, but I think that um, if you like kind of equilibrium processes um, uh, might predominate over kind of localized catalytic processes. But, right. but, but on the other hand, um, the, the place that that time scale um, doesn't apply to is the exosphere. And there's a great deal of um, interest in the, the exosphere at the moment because it's so different to a lot of the other planets. So the way in which um, very low density um, amounts of unusual materials for, for, if you like, vapors or gases exist in space behave with respect to each other and the chemistry of that, that all operates very quickly under very extreme conditions. So, and you, you know, you've got the possibilities of vapors interacting with uh, interesting materials, having mm. interesting surface chemistries. Um, so that's possible. But um, at the moment, I don't think we really have enough in, information on that. Right. What I might add to that, though, um, is um, I, I, when I was thinking about talking to you guys where you are, um, I think it's really interesting to think about the way that planets form. Um, in as the early geochemists did in the form of a smelting pot or a blast furnace um, and I did that for the solar system which is a kind of strange vapory blast furnace but you can do it for a molten planet too um, and geologists and geochemists recently when they got the data from mercury had to start reinventing all the chemistry they knew because it had all been devised mm. in experiments on earth materials with silicon and its friend oxygen there together mm. and everything mm. else is controlled by that. But if you take the oxygen out of it, things that we used to regard as things that love to form oxides, we call them lithophiles, yes. actually don't. They, they behave in different ways. And so, you know, the silicon actually prefers to go into iron metal, mm. um, which a metallurgist would be familiar with. Um, and the sulfur prefers to do the opposite. It likes metal, we think, because you know, meteorites tell us that sulfides like iron 
meteorites, but it actually tends to go and join all the rocky stuff above mm. it. Mm -hmm. um, so what's happening now, which is exciting for us, is that this uh, and keeps us all in a job is that people are doing new experiments with different chemistries. Um, and there's, there's, uh, it's given us a whole new um, world to play with, which is, which uh, for geeks like me is very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you very much indeed for that, Simon. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm looking around for other questions. Oh, Peter Lloyd. Yes, I, I, I'd add my thanks, Simon, too, for a fascinating talk about a cratered world. And being uh, much more familiar with the moon, I was continually comparing what you were telling me about the craters on, on Mercury with those on the moon. And they're exceptionally similar, as you might expect. But I was very taken when you talked about the, the lava flows. You've already mentioned that they must have been much more fluid than, than a lot of the lavas on Earth are, but very like the ones on the moon, which must yeah. also have been extremely fluid because they mm. flowed over huge distances. And they filled up all the basins and things as well. Yes. But you did seem to imply that some of these craters have been filled with impact melt. Mm -hmm. And I think on the moon, you tend to you get impact melt, but it tends to be small splashes around the outside of big craters. It doesn't fill the whole of the inside. Yes. It's usually stuff that's either fallen down the, the walls or it's uh, lava and magma that's come up from below. Yes, cert well, certainly um, small craters um, which don't have excavators deep and therefore don't kind of access the heat from the planet's interior and trigger volcanism but they also are the ones that are most likely to fill with the impact melt uh, because yeah. it's it's a it's a it's a smallish hole um but yes larger craters um if you get a large crater which has got a smooth uh fill within it that's that's uh, uh flattish and has fewer younger craters on top of it that's likely to be lava um, and we also see these kind of ghost craters that are filled in by it. Um, the compositions are different as well if you do the detailed chemical compositions of it. Um, and also if you have a even a relatively small crater that's kind of filled to the brim, that's more likely to be lava um, either coming from somewhere outside and flowing into it or, or coming up a fracture from underneath from melt in the interior. Um, in uh, in terms of um, the, the lavas and their behaviour, um, mercury lavas are likely to be even more fluid than lunar ones. So most of the lunar lavas are basalts, um, which have, you know, high 40s, low 50s percent silica in them. And that, that makes them fairly sticky, but, but, but pretty runny. So, they, so I've, there's, a, there's a comment here about Kilauea in the chat there. Um, Kilauea is a basalt and it's, it's fairly runny and it makes big broad shield volcanoes and flood basalts, a bit like, like on Iceland. Um, but mercury, um, they would be less silica rich and even runnier. So a very large eruption would spread its lava very thin and over very, very large areas. Um, so that there, there would be a difference uh, in the behavior of the two. There, there are very few uh, eruptions of that kind of stuff on Earth now, so we don't get to see it erupting very much, certainly on a big scale. Um, so the the mercury lavas behave a bit like the moons, but but they're a lot hotter and even runnier. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, can I just ask one other thing? Um, I'm wondering whether in the, the pictures that you get from Mercury, whether the vertical scales have been exaggerated compared with the horizontal ones. The reason I ask is I know this tends to happen on the moon. We think of craters as having very steep walls, but if you actually look at the topography in proper scales, they're actually very shallow. Um, and I'm wondering whether the pictures from Mercury also gave the impression of much steeper uh, inside walls to the craters than they really are. Yes, I think I think that's possibly right. Um, I think there, there's a there's a I'm, I'm kind of working from the kind of mechanical idea that that if, if there's less gravity but the rocks are just as strong, it'll tend to support steeper slopes. And I I'm, I'm, I'm maybe you know as a, as a as an arm waving hypothesis, I may be being influenced by the fact that if you get very intense illumination or shadow uh, 
it, it, yeah. it tends to make you think that things are steeper than they are. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, and so perhaps that's why it is. But, but um, uh, and of course, you know, Mercury is a relatively small body like the moon. So uh, uh, an, an image that covers quite a large area is going to be distorted by uh, the effects of the perspective and the curvature of the surface, I think, too. Um, but uh, but yeah, you always have to be careful of uh, of these biases created by the way the image is put together and then the way that the image is processed afterwards. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm looking around and, oh, Peter. Yeah, and sort of just building on that a little bit. So, for example, if we landed on the surface of Mercury, would would it be uh, sort of like would it look like the Moon? I'm, I mean, for example, a micrometeorite uh, erosion. Uh, initially, before the space age, we thought that there'd be craggy mountains on the Moon. Does that, is there any evidence of that effect on Mercury? Um, well, I think one of the things through, I think it was possibly um, radar-like imaging. Um, that, that um, Mariner told us is that Mercury has a very dusty surface mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know Mercury has no atmosphere just this fine exosphere where you might get you know a molecule every few hundred meters yeah. um, that, that means uh, that anything flying through space um, is going to hit the surface at enormous velocity so it's like the moon, it's been um, pulverized over a large part of, for billions of years, most mm -hmm. of it. Um, e even, the, um, even the repaved lava surfaces with fewer craters, they've been around for billions of years, probably hundreds of millions of years. So the surface will be very, uh, will be dusty. Um, the way in which the surface responds to certain kind of irradiation, um, tells us that it's made of lots of very small particles. Um, incidentally, that, that also makes it very difficult to know what the rocks are underneath. All we can yeah. tell is an average composition of the rocks underneath by mixing of lots of particles together to make a, a, dust, um, a dusty soil. Um, so we have to be very careful how we extrapolate what the rocks are uh, by looking at uh, dust which is a kind of average of all the rocks underneath it mixed up it's actually called uh, crater gardening i think by some of the early lunar mission scientists um so so yes uh, uh, i think uh, it's uh, it's actually covered in dust and, uh, and again like the smooth surface of the polar regions of mars you know which is a kind of ocean of dust yeah. that doesn't give us very much uh, a way about the secrets underneath it mm -hmm. Like a regolith, basically. Yes, indeed, it's a regolith. And um, I guess like the moon, um, that regolith may be kilometres deep. I think mm. on the moon it's been estimated that the regolith or the fractured regolith layers up to 10 kilometres deep mm. in places, in the, in the oldest parts of the crust. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Peter. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've worked Simon really hard this evening. So in our usual manner, uh, Mexican Swinton Manor, can we give him uh, a very big thank you? Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you very much.